Hello, everyone. The uh, much anticipated unwrapping of Takabuti in 1835 by Belfast Natural History Society created huge interest and excitement, but the event was delayed to ensure the presence of one man to decipher the hieroglyphs. He was not a professor, nor from the British Museum, or even a professional Egyptologist. He was a country parson, an amateur Orientalist, the Reverend Dr. Edward Hinks, Rector of Killalay, County Down. Remarkably, some years later, he was rewarded the gold medal by the King of Prussia, a precursor to our Nobel Prize, on the same day as Michael Faraday, one of the world's greatest ever scientists. And furthermore, a marble bust of Hinks was placed in the entrance hall of the Cairo Museum to honor his immense contribution to Egyptology. And ironically, this was not even his greatest accomplishment, which was at the same time pioneering the decipherment of the ancient writing and language of Babylon and Assyria, known as Akkadian cuneiform. His great contemporaries and rivals had posts in universities, museums, or the diplomatic corps, or had private means. Hinks had none of this. He spent the greater part of his life, 41 years, as rector of a remote, poor, and isolated country parish in County Down, in a time of rebellion, political turmoil, and famine. There were no museums or libraries containing material for his research. There was an unreliable postal service, no means or opportunity to travel. He never visited Egypt or Assyria to see the buildings and inscriptions on which he worked. He never completed a popular account of his discoveries, and he appears to have become frustrated and bitter in his dealings with the British Museum, and particularly his rival, Sir Henry Rawlinson. All of these things have contributed to his obscurity. His personal life was not easy either due to his wife's mental health issues and his constant financial insecurity. But fortunately for us, during his life, he corresponded with all the great scholars in both fields and wrote many learned papers on both languages. The list of his papers published after his death ran to 15 pages. Sir Austin Henry Layard, the excavator of Nineveh, considered him the first man to discover the proper method of deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs, and the scholar Professor Sice called him the founder of the Assyrian grammar. Now, the history of Ireland never really meanders quietly along, and there are fairly frequent cataracts of fervour and rebellion which touch the lives of many generations. So Hinks, born in Cork in 1792, grew up in heady and turbulent times, with the 1798 rebellion, the Napoleonic Wars, and land issues. He came from a family of high achievers. His father was a professor of Hebrew. One brother became a bishop and another the Prime Minister of Upper Canada and Governor of Barbados. Hinks excelled at Trinity College Dublin, coming first in the entrance exam aged 15 and winning many awards. A glittering career in the church or academia beckoned, but a tendency to be his own worst enemy first showed itself. Strong political views then as now seem to permeate universities, and it would seem that Edward Hinks was no exception to this. Hinks had written a poem praising Napoleon Bonaparte. This was not a very desirable thing to do in wartime, but especially as the Duke of Wellington was an Irish aristocrat. The French had been involved in the 1798 and 1803 rebellions, which had threatened the very existence of the Protestant ascendancy, of which Hinks himself was a member. Napoleon did, however, play a huge role in the foundation of Egyptology. And in addition, Hinks also seriously fell out with the professor of Hebrew at Trinity due to an incompatibility with his senior but less talented colleague, Charles Wall. Unfortunately, Hinks had fallen out with a man who became the president of the very influential Royal Irish Academy. Another life-changing event was falling out with Thomas Ellrington, the Trinity College provost, who was in charge of training all the ministers in the Anglican Church in Ireland and had an enormous influence and patronage with regard to the placement of ministers in good parishes. Hinks blamed his problems with advancement in the church and in academia on the faults of others, but here we have the first evidence that his problems were often due to his own personality and views. He moved eventually to a living in Killalay, County Down, where he remained for 41 years despite many efforts to move somewhere more suitable for his research. It would be wrong, however, to downgrade the importance of his ministry and his life. He had robustly but amicably defended his church's position in a debate with three Roman Catholic clergy in the Downpatrick discussion in 1820, 
Politically, however, he was a supporter of very contentious educational reform and Catholic emancipation, which again, no doubt, affected his advancement in the church. Feelings in Ireland were running very high, as can be seen in this punch cartoon showing Daniel O'Connell as a potato and describing him as the real potato blight in Ireland. Hinks embarked on his studies of Egypt, Assyria and Babylonia at a time when rigid religious authority was being threatened by the Industrial Revolution and new scientific discoveries. Many of the early Egyptian exploration expeditions were funded by religious organisations and it is perhaps hard for us in the 21st century to appreciate that one of the main reasons for the progress in Egyptology and Assyriology in the 19th century was to prove the historical accuracy of the Bible. In Ireland, particularly where Archbishop Usher in Armagh had fixed the date of creation at nightfall on October the 22nd, 4004 BC, the single-minded interest of Hinks in Egyptian chronology and past astronomical events with the potential challenge to the Bible narrative again caused unease within the church. By a strange twist of fate, however, the first known mention of a Hebrew king or any biblical phenomenon in an archaeological record was by none other than Edward Hinks, who identified Jehu, son of Omri, as named and depicted bringing tribute to Shalmaneser at Nimrod. The depth of this religious feeling is echoed in the address following Hinks's funeral by his brother. He said, your late pastor so highly gifted declared again and again that no discovery he ever made through the slightest to credit upon any fact recorded in the Holy Scripture, but on the contrary, all tended to confirm the sacred record. Edward Hinks certainly had a complex and multifaceted personality. On one hand, he doted on his daughters and maintained many long-term friends. However, he could also be very difficult and scathing to his perceived intellectual inferiors and even to his own brother. In 1833, he published a very important paper on the encorial language of Egypt, demonstrating that he had a firm grasp of the decipherment of ancient Egyptian and gave an outline of demotic in this article. The demotic or encorial, which is Greek for native or rustic, is the everyday script in the middle of the Rosetta Stone. It is here that Hinks shows evidence of genius and indeed his almost modern approach to the subject. Hinks was the first to understand the uniqueness of this phase of the Egyptian language. He then began to work on old Persian cuneiform to gain new perspective as an Egyptologist, but rapidly made huge progress in decipherment and ironically, this was from second-hand information trickling into Killalay, while his main rival, Colonel Rawlinson, was often on site, dangling from a rope over a cliff edge, actually recording the inscriptions. This rivalry escalated over the decipherment of the ancient writings of the language of Assyria and Babylon, known as Akkadian cuneiform, which followed the discovery of the library of King Assurbanipal at Nineveh in 1842, containing tens of thousands of clay cuneiform tablets. The discoverer of the tablets, Austin Henry Layard, arranged to visit Hinks in Killalay, arriving on 24th of September 1852, and he actually stayed for three weeks, and they both worked daily on the inscriptions. Layard, on his book on Nineveh and Babylon, did indeed fully acknowledge his indebtedness to Hinks. And also on his return to London, Layard wrote to the British Museum in support of Hinks's wish for employment, which proved successful. Layard was an MP as well as a scholar, and it is easy to tell this from his letters, which are full of advice on how Hinks should handle the trustees in the British Museum. This echoes advice given to Hinks by Dr. Robinson of Armagh, who wrote to Hinks regarding his response to the adoption of Rawlinson without acknowledgement of Hinks's discovery that the cuneatic characters represent syllables. He said, I do not wonder that you feel much hurt at thus being plucked to dress out others. Your opponent, however, has great advantages over you. He is a trained diplomatic. He therefore may do things with impunity which the public would not suffer in a country person. For this reason, I have penciled some modification of your text in which, without weakening the force of your statements, I have a little softened their causticity. 
So even Hinks's friends could see that the dice were heavily loaded in favor of Rollins and were continually trying to prevent him from becoming embittered and disheartened. But thanks to Layard, a golden opportunity had been presented to Hinks to allow him to work within the British Museum starting May 1853, preparing transliterations and translations with notes of the Nimrod inscription and the Sennacherib inscription. He spent two months in London altogether and worked the rest of the year on the inscriptions in Killalay. So Hinks's circumstances finally seemed to be improving, and this was further enhanced by the award of a pension of £100 per year by Lord Aberdeen. And Layard, who was instrumental in this, was particularly pleased for his friend. However, Hinks became very unhappy with the trustees in the British Museum, and a dispute began which festered for several years. Writing to Layard, he said, I have no idea that the trustees will publish my work. I think it is very possible they will allow the use of it privately so as to enable him to carry out the work. I am being cast off, and it may be that the person thus benefited may not acknowledge the source from which he derives information. Rawlinson will be in London, I suppose, forthwith, and I have no doubt he will be allowed free access to all that the museum possesses. He was in very low spirits. The British Museum trustees had withheld from publication for nearly two years the manuscripts, and he became increasingly convinced that Rawlinson would have access to them. William Fox Talbot, the photography pioneer, like Layard, appears to have been a very pleasant and sensible man who tried to help Hinks and indeed settle his mind. He suggested that Hinks should submit a memorial to the trustees of the British Museum. And Fox Talbot went to a lot of trouble showing this memorial to the museum authorities for their eventual approval. And on 4th of August 1854, the manuscripts were placed in the Department of Manuscripts and made accessible to the public, which amounted to a publication of their contents so as to entitle him to the credit of priority in respect to any discoveries that they contained, thus bringing this disagreeable affair to a satisfactory conclusion. Hinks's paranoia regarding Colonel Rawlinson had not one of many friends, however, in the British Museum. But was it unjustified paranoia? It now turns out that on the 7th of June 1854, the day after Hinks had been paid for this work, Sir Henry Ellis of the British Museum had written to Rawlinson, offering him the sight of the manuscripts or even sending him a copy of the inscriptions. As Professor Cathcart, the publisher of Hinks' letters, points out, perhaps Hinks' suspicions were well founded. Hinks and Rawlinson, together with Jules Opper from France and the photography pioneer William Fox Talbot, soon emerged as the leaders in this new field of Assyriology. However, there remained a difficulty in trying to persuade the cautious and sceptical scholars in museums and universities that their decipherment was acceptable and was not made up. In 1857, Fox Talbot set up a test invigilated by an eminent committee of scholars. An unseen inscription was given independently to Hinks, Rawlinson, Opper and Fox Talbot and their translations compared. They were found to be very close, especially that of Hinks and Rawlinson, proving that their decipherment was accurate. Despite increasing ill health due to probable chronic gallbladder disease and recurrent depression in the latter part of his life, he continued with all his research, but it is clear from his voluminous correspondence that he continually worried about the financial security of his family. Edward Hinks had heard that the deanery of Armagh was vacant and he applied. He hoped that this would give him more time for his researches and his longed-for financial security for his family. He was very disconsolate in a letter to Layard when he did not get the post, and it is interesting that so many people, such as Layard, Lord John Russell, the Prime Minister, Lord Manchester, and numerous MPs supported him in his application, but to no avail. Dr. Hanks again seems to have become very despondent regarding his situation at this time. Numerous letters mention that he is to be quietly laid on the shelf and that it is useless to complain. Hinks's brother Francis, a Premier of Upper Canada, had been in London on government business and wrote to Lord Derby, the new Prime Minister, on Edward's behalf in 1852. This well-meaning intervention infuriated Edward, which gives us an insight into some aspects of his personality. He wrote many remarkably caustic and unfortunate letters to Sir Henry Ellis of the British Museum, Layard, Lord Derby, etc., to let them know that any requests by his brother were unauthorised by him. 
It is a testimony, though, to his ever inquiring mind and the wide scope of his knowledge that he was also working on a paper on the acceleration of the moon's rate of revolution and the retardation of the rate of rotation of the Earth in the weeks before his death. On 30th of November 66, the last entry in his now lost diary was unwell to bed at 9.15. On de December the 3rd, he died suddenly and peacefully while reading in bed, and ironically, his bitter rival, Colonel Rawlinson, was partly instrumental in obtaining a pension for his family. Edward Hinks exhibited several exceptional gifts that shaped his life. He was a superb linguist, fluent in 13 languages, including French, German, Italian, Gaelic, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin and Sanskrit, etc. Coupled with this, he was a successful code breaker, winning an unbreakable code competition prize of £100 as a young man, a very considerable sum in those days. He was also a published mathematician and a highly regarded astronomer. He could therefore see connections and patterns in obscure writings that others could not. He was a scholar's scholar and did not produce any great textbook or work accessible to the general public to bring him widespread fame and success, and he did not have the people's skills to advance his career within the church or academia. He was hailed as a great man of letters in his lifetime, but there is a marked sense of unfulfillment about him. His amazing legacy, however, is that he reveled in being a problem solver, and he produced groundbreaking world-class work in Assyriology and Egyptology from his rectory in Kilo. Despite limited resources, scarce access to papyri and inscriptions, and never travelling to the Middle East, which rivalled and indeed surpassed that from the great universities across Europe.